So today I am joined by Jono Alderson. He is special ops at Yoast, an absolute guru in the SEO world. I'm sure you've heard of Jono. And I have the pleasure of talking to him today. So we're, I think the first place for us to start at, Jono, is how did you get into marketing? How did it all begin? So I started out as a, a web developer building little websites for like local small businesses, butchers and bakers, um, just because I was really interested in HTML and, and the web. And then by a whole bunch of kind of accidents and being in the right place at the right time, fell into digital marketing agencies, um, which at the time it was all a bit of a Wild West still. Um, I had things like um, Google Analytics was still a novelty and conversion rate optimization was a new frontier. And most of the client work was, um, can you build us a pretty flash website to act as a brochure? And I was just in the right place to start saying, well, hold on, how do we measure success? And there's this whole SEO thing that we aren't really doing a lot with where really beyond just thinking about the tech, we need to think about how do we meet user needs and what are user needs and how do we understand that? And gradually found that what I was doing was transforming from being a techie and a developer to a digital marketer. Um, so yeah, it happened very organically. And I'm still, I think, on that journey a bit. I'm still very much a developer and a techie at heart and marketing is a kind of a forced thing I have to do on top of that. But it's it's just as interesting. Yeah, I remember those days when you were working with agencies. That's how we met all that time Yeah, way ago. back in the day. I know. It was a while ago, wasn't it? And it was, we created a, it was a link building campaign. It was just really early days then for doing that type oh, of Oh, don't tell people I did link building. I've, I've <laughs> quietly, quietly ignored all of that. Yeah, no, it was. It was way it back in the very was. early days. Yeah, it really was. A long time ago. Okay, so what did your current role involve then as special ops at Yoast? Um, all sorts of stuff. It's conveniently undefined, which allows me to bounce around a bit and to fit in wherever's helpful. But for the most part, there's a lot of product feature scoping. So a lot of the stuff that will end up in the Yoast SEO plugin suite, say a year from now, I've, I've touched and shaped. Um, and a lot of that is around, I also spend a lot of time making sure that I've got a really deep and really broad technical expertise around whatever technical SEO is today, which increasingly is schema and structured data and site performance and even bits of security now. So I spend a lot of time making sure that I'm right on the cutting edge of all of that. Um, and then a lot of time in the SEO industry. So I spend a lot of time on Twitter, on trying to understand what are people's challenges, um, what does SEO look like in the real world? I speak at a lot of conferences to kind of share that knowledge and, and see other people's positioning. And then I do a lot of dog fooding internally at Yoast. So are we following our own rules and guidelines? Do they make sense? Um, and then feeding all of that back into our product suite. So it's a nice circular, just kind of do the thing, understand the thing, build the thing, see how it works in the real world. It's, it's fascinating. I love that, the dog feeding, dog food, uh, <laughs> <of> our, <laughs> a unique phrase there. Uh, any advice that you'd share for aspiring marketers? Maybe they're just starting out in the industry or maybe they're actually starting out in SEO specifically. Yeah, um, it is so easy and easier than ever to just build things now and play. All the barriers to getting hold of technology and platforms and hosting, all of that is just clicks and either free or so cheap as to be inconsequential, you can bootstrap a thing. Maybe that's a product. Maybe you want to sell something you've made. Maybe you want to, maybe just a personal blog, but build the thing and iterate on it and improve it because it's it's so hard to learn on your feet with client work and with your with if you're working for a business with things which might go wrong. You want to fail on your own terms a little bit and you very quickly just iterate, get annoyed at what you build last week, improve it, refine it. Um, that's That kind of exploration and play is really, I find, one of the best ways um, for, for me to learn. Certainly not all people, but I know a whole bunch of people learn that way. And then you can try and start to monetize it, try and apply marketing principles, even if it's only a few dollars or pounds here or there. You can reinvest that. You can spend some money on Facebook ads. You can monitor your performance, set up the analytics, iterate. And you find that as you connect all these bits of disciplines and stuff together, you learn so, so much more doing it and walking through it and playing with it than you do in theory. So almost kind of forget about perfection, just get into the, into the nitty gritty and just start. And start yeah, and, and then, then go to the other end, then chase towards perfection. And as a result of that, you'll start to form strong opinions on what's good and what's bad and what works and, and what's rubbish. Sometimes you'll be right, sometimes you'll be wrong, but then you can invite yourself into conversations. You can jump into a Twitter thread and say, hey, SEO celebrity X, 
I, I have a different opinion or a different expertise, and you can validate that and you can stand by it. And then, oh, now now you're an SEO celebrity, a digital marketing celebrity. You you form those opinions and just invite yourself into the conversations, but you you earn those opinions by doing the work. Is that something that you do, John? I regularly on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think form opinions on Twitter is a lot of what we do. Yeah, I mm, gotta be a bit careful, but yeah, I, no, I think it's it's Twitter's a weird microcosm, right? Um, especially SEO Twitter, and so much of SEO is polarizing, and it's very easy to get stuck in a way of thinking, um, which is dangerous. You want to challenge and be challenged and evolve. So I quite like poking the bear a little bit occasionally, just to make sure that we're not all just spouting what we were spouting ten years ago, and that we're we're challenging ourselves and each other. Anyone who doesn't already follow John O should do on Twitter. It's highly entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, in the interview, in the book, in my new book, Marketing Strategy, you share your thoughts on the future of SEO. And it's really a fascinating piece there that you've contributed. So thanks so much for adding that. Yeah. Um, what are your top three areas that businesses should really focus their efforts on? Top three areas. Um, so I think you have to try and understand the problems and the pain points of your audience, which sounds pretty straightforward. That's marketing 101, right? Product market fit. But through the medium of somebody typing something into a search box, a lot of which will be ambiguous or complex or long-winded, and you have to try and work out what are, what are the... What are, what is this person actually trying to solve for? And quite more often than not, it's not going to be a one-to-one -one relationship with the keyword that they've typed in. And in order to help those people, you need to build and continually improve web pages which solve for those problems, which again sounds pretty basic, but a lot of people don't. They build pages that try and sell their product or service. And as a result, there's a huge disconnect between all these people who are typing things into search boxes and then not finding solutions. They're just finding you trying to sell them things. So then on top of that, you've got to try and create flywheels and momentum, which drives engagement and evangelism and citation and reputation and growth. And somewhere in all of those, you need to identify a mechanism to extract revenue. But you can't start with that as your keystone, because then you'll never outperform the pages and the sites which genuinely just help people to solve their problems and their pain points. Remember that what Google are trying to do is help users solve their problems, not help users to buy your thing from your website. So you've got to start with that and then, then work out the monetization angle afterwards. And of course, every business comes about this the other way. They say, we want to sell a thing. What content should we produce? It's got to be the other way around. Yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating that I know we've had lots of conversations about this in the past where that is the whole goal of Google. If you don't give a good, res if you don't give a good experience after using Google, Google's not going to want to go send that traffic to your website anymore simple as because th that their whole ethos is about providing a good customer experience from a search query perspective and answering that query and it's fascinating isn't it that organizations still miss that that point that that is ultimately what google is there for to find an answer to a query whether that is to purchase at the end of it you know is, is a separate goal entirely but actually to get the information to answer that query that they had do you think, what, why do you think that still remains, even after all of this time, that still remains the thought process in it? And it's just not, it's not consistently there at the very beginning when they're thinking about using SEO. Because I think that for as long as we've had advertising and marketing and sales, the mechanism has been stand on the street or get media in front of people and convince them to come to your property and convince them to buy your thing. If I shout loud enough or tell the most, have the most compel compelling message, regardless of how much I embellish my strengths or, or ignore my weaknesses, I can convince enough people to come into my store, onto my webpage, and then my sales process convince them to convert. And now what's happened is in between your audience and your services is an omniscient AI, which decides whether or not you're a good fit. And it doesn't matter how much you shout and how much you try and convince or try and reach the consumers to convince them you're a good fit. You can't access them because the AI has decided you're not a good fit. And so much of the way we approach business starts with this, I want to sell a thing. How do I shout at enough people to get 2% of them to buy it? It doesn't consider this whole new dynamic of, okay, I've got to, I've got to convince this machine learning system that I am genuinely a good fit and that my thing solves their problems on a page by page level on a content level on a reputation level 
And that's still remarkably new. And it's so alien from the way that we think about marketing um, and then selling to people. So I think it's going to take a while for people to get there if they ever do. Um, and the other thought is people still don't really consider that Google doesn't care about your brand or your website. They just they they need to return a good result, maybe not even 10 good results. They need to solve the problem. And it doesn't matter if it's Wikipedia that does that or your sales site. And they don't have a vested interest in rewarding or even enabling individual businesses to survive if they're not a good fit. And I think we'll see the businesses who don't adapt to this way of thinking just never entering the consideration set because the AI will think these, these guys aren't trying. They're not demonstrating that they are the solution to these problems. Don't show them. We'll just show the one that is. And businesses will fail. Yeah, I think that is a really good point. I think that's the bit that the thought process is missing quite a lot of the time. That it, And it sounds really cutthroat, but it's Google and that is their business model. <laughs> that is what they do. Yeah. And you can you can fight that. You can try and market elsewhere. You can try and push back on it. You can go offline. You can just use Facebook. None of those are good solutions. Like if you, you want to access consumers, the mechanism by which consumers decide what and where and how they're going to buy is search. Oh, not always, but enough, that, <laughs> close enough that it doesn't make any difference. So you're kind of stuck playing that game. And we can complain about the way in which Google extracts and monetizes and resurfaces content all we like. The point we're missing is that the new normal is for a system to determine whether or not we're a good fit. And you have to convince that system, whether it's Google or Facebook or something else entirely. Yeah, completely. Okay, so are there, is there like a key area that you think businesses and marketers should avoid when they're focusing on SEO specifically? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think there's still a tendency to obsess over where you rank for a given keyword um, or why you dropped a position or why a specific competitor outranks you for a specific query. And you can see why, right? The CEO is sat in the boardroom saying, why does competitor outrank us? We're better. And it's the same kind of problem. You, your product might be better. Your business might be better, whatever better means. But it, you're not necessarily demonstrating that on a page level or there are other factors at play. And in fact, Rankings in particular change and fluctuate. They're based on hundreds, maybe thousands of factors, many of which are outside of your control, some of which might be the phase of the moon or the number of pages on Wikipedia, because those things might in turn affect the size and shape and nature of the web. Like this is profoundly outside of our control and they vary based on where your users are, etc. But I think there's another flavor which really people struggle with, which is that for some kinds of searches, whether those are keywords that people type into a box or things they say to their Google Home or whatever other mechanism, maybe your business or your business model just isn't a good fit. Like a product manufacturer will always struggle to rank for comparative keywords, top X, best X, because you can't demonstrate a neutral perspective on that because you're always going to say, well, we're the best. Actually, Google has to return for that kind of query a whole bunch of comparison sites. And it doesn't matter how much you say we are the best, we deserve to be on that. It's the wrong type of search because Google understands that what users want and what they expect is a different type of experience. Or a certain type of search might be, some of the results might need to be e-commerce, but some of them might need to be informational. And so there are only maybe two or three slots on the search results that you can compete for, and maybe you're number four or five, and you're never going to out you're never going to displace a commercial result if the if you're um, using informational content to rank with. So there's all sorts of scenarios where it just doesn't make sense to focus on how do we rank better for this keyword. That's really fascinating uh, and, and, and takes in into account the customer journey as well, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Each element needs a different, you need to think about the different perspective and, and the context of that, don't you? Yeah, and this is the other thing that I think really the whole SEO industry struggles with and is still struggling with is you you really can't treat it like a direct response channel anymore. Uh, certainly not, not unless you're a huge brand and uh, you've got an unlimited budget because this isn't how people search. People don't just decide what they're going to buy, type in a competitive keyword into Google and then visit the top site and purchase. They have multiple tabs and multiple devices and multiple sessions and multiple consideration stages and all of that have in, in all of that they're also looking at your competitors content 
And none of your analytics ecosystem can or ever will see or account for that, not well enough to build models of it. So, of course, businesses are risk averse and they are channel centric. So all of their spending and analysis um, focuses on those last click keywords where there's high intent and commercial intent where people buy. But that means you only ever build strategies and tactics around capturing the people who were already going to buy which is the people right at the bottom of the funnel. And you miss out on helping the people who are starting their journeys. And then everything that happens after that changes based on your interaction with them. And you miss out in um, capturing the people who are considering solutions from 10 of your competitors by giving them a better experience halfway through the funnel. And the sad thing is you never even know that you're missing out on all these people because they never arrive at your website. Because in the 20 things they did in the run-up to it, they saw competitor content, they were helped by other people, and they ended up elsewhere. And, and then as a result, the business goes, oh, you know what, SEO isn't working, focus more on these competitive hyper keywords or go put it in paid search. You, we have to think about SEO as a branding activity and an opportunity to help our audiences in a way that builds brand preference and recall so that as they go through those wibbly wobbly funnels, um, they eventually think, oh yes, okay, that, that's the brand that's genuinely good for me, for my need. It's difficult. Yeah, I really like that. Think about it less as a direct channel and more about a branding channel. I think that's that gives you that mindset change. Okay, so if we think about marketing strategy from a broader perspective, because you also get involved in in that and have a lot of experience in that, um, what are the key challenges that you've experienced when working with brands and clients when implementing a marketing strategy? I think quite often, and this is terrible to say, but you you have to find and start with some kind of value. And a lot of the time, that's quite difficult. Um, so many businesses aren't differentiated or don't have a unique value proposition other than we're slightly cheaper or we're slightly closer, all of which are fairly easy to displace. And quite often, the biggest challenge is finding or having to create the thing you're going to market. It's not enough to have a product. I, I, again, you, you can't just shout louder than the competitors because systems decide whether you show up or not and increasingly other people determine whether or not you're recommended and, and end up in consideration sets. You have to have something um, unique. You have to do something unique or do something uniquely, which I really like as a mindset um, and so many places don't. But you can start to engineer that and put that in place. But until you've got that worked out what that is and have something which um, gives you a moat against competitors. It's not just enough to do something different. You have to create some kind of competitive gap where you can't just be copied. It's really hard to do any meaningful marketing. You can do as much advertising as you want, but it's hard to do any marketing on top of that. Yeah, well, marketing is an art, right? It's not supposed to be so <laughs> yep. easy to just do. And yeah, absolutely where the science behind marketing comes in. So what do you think are the key ingredients that should be included in a marketing strategy? This is contentious, but I really think you have to give people an experience. And I know there's a lot of debate at the moment around um, brand purpose and brand identity. Uh, lots of thinking that people don't want a product, they want an experience, they want to feel, they want to see a brand standing up for something or being associated with a cause. But there's equal amounts of thinking that people just want to buy the damn product and the experience is just fluff. I think both of these can be right. I think that the just give me the product cheaply is a type of experience. Um, famously, um, I know uh, for, as a wonderful example from years ago, I wish I knew where it had come from, but um, EasyJet um, is a horrendous experience to fly with. Like, unequivocally, absolutely awful in every respect. Every touch point, every interaction, the flight itself is appalling. You However, sound a true fan there, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful, right? Oh, but... The moment you click checkout on the website and it is dirt cheap is a great experience. And it's precisely the experience that that brand is optimizing for. They deliver an experience and it's a great one. It's just not obvious where or what that is in the funnel. And that's part of why they're so successful. And yes, that, you can boil that down to as simple as it's cheap. But that cheapness combats the, the fact that the rest of the experience is pretty rubbish. So I think... Um, I think you have to deliver some sort of experience. And that might be an aspect of your customer service. It might be part of your content. It might be the product packaging. It doesn't really matter as long as it's enough to differentiate you and to, to start conversation. You have to, 
to to build a competitive moat, you have to have some sort of flywheel based on reputation, based on citation, based on people liking and sharing and talking about you. And the way you do that is one of the ways you do that is you bake experiences into the process of engaging with your content, your product, your services, et cetera. Um, that's how you build your moat, or at least it's one of the most effective ways to. Hugely contentious, but I think what, however you want to call it and frame it, you have to do something which stands out. Yeah, a differentiation piece. It's interesting that you mentioned EasyJet because I think today they launched EasyJet Marketing, which I was Oh, I saw that. Sure. Yeah, easy, easy Marketing. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's all. Yeah, I'm that's not sure how... they've understood. <laughs> no, I think they need to listen to this. <laughs> Maybe well, as you say, it's so an easy. art, right? You can't, you can't do off-the-shelf um, campaigns, not in a way that's going to make an impact. No, it's going to be very interesting what happens with that, I think. <laughs> So what do you think are the most common pitfalls that a marketer faces? You know, I mentioned 10 in the book. What, what do you think are the most common and how can marketers overcome them? I think the most common thing I've found is people getting stuck thinking, and this goes back to what I was saying, getting stuck thinking that they have to market the thing as it is rather than trying to make the thing more inherently marketable. Uh, again, one of the most important things you need in order to succeed, certainly in digital marketing today and where it's going, is that kind of flywheel where you have a virtuous circle of people have good experiences, they talk about it, they bring more people on, they have good experiences and so on and so forth. A lot of the things you need in order to build that flywheel are a marketable thing. And the analogy I keep coming back to is for a theoretical restaurant. So let's say you're trying to do some SEO or you're trying to build a reputation, whatever. Um, most marketing strategies will think about content. Maybe some will think about photography. Maybe some will think about messaging or even billboards and TV adverts. But very few will think about the ingredients used in the food or the training of the chef or the font on the menus. But all of these things influence our flywheel. They influence the propensity to be reviewed, to be cited, to be recommended, and so on. And in the digital ecosystem in particular, but more broadly as well, Google, Facebook, TV adverts, et cetera, are increasingly arbiters of which brands and products enter our consideration sets. And more interestingly, which ones we do, which ones don't? Like, how many brands do these systems decide we never see because they don't think we're a good fit? And these are all heavily influenced um, from the way they observe audiences interacting with those brands. Did they click? Did they visit? Did they review? Did they retweet? Did they link? Did they say something good? Was the sentiment? Yada, yada. Our marketing needs to think about how we create evidence of positive audience experiences. And you can't plaster that on top as a layer of paint. You have to really get to the, the heart of the thing and make it marketable. So I think um, we should give ourselves permission to, to dig deeper um, when we start to do marketing rather than just kind of painting a nice surface on it. Yeah. If if it's a there's a really really good model um if it's a product related that chef included it in the book I, f I think it's really useful where it talks about the three layers of a product and it's called augmented product model and in the center it has the core product like what the actual product the problem that it solves um and then it has the outer layer of the product so what the features are and it talks about the augmented part of the product so the after aftercare sales and mm. all the extras that come with the product because it's not just a case of i'm just going to go and buy this razor but actually there's so much more that comes with that like you said you know the packaging the whole branding the messaging the values of the company um you know it's it's really interesting to see the response to an organization changing their values like base camp i don't know if you've seen this <laughs> yeah that's messy isn't it very messy because they've changed their core fundamental values of a business with yeah. no consultation they've just gone and done it because the founders thought it was the right thing to do and it's not only that the employees have are starting to leave en masse i think they've lost already 30 percent of their the top staff Ouch. But also customers are like, I don't, I don't want to be associated with this anymore. And yeah. it becomes so much more of a, so much more important to think about those values of the, of your organization. If you do change them, it's a huge risk. You're going to switch your audience off entirely. Yeah, this will be in the textbooks we're all studying a decade from now, right? <laughs> but I think this is, so retention is not cool. It's never been as fun as acquisition and it's not where the budget goes. But I think we see so many smaller examples of exactly this kind of, of 
challenge. Well, it, having bad customer service impacts you in exactly the same kind of way as Basecamp imploding their whole culture. Maybe only 1% as much, but this kind of thing really erodes erodes the... I really dislike the word flywheel, but it, it, it erodes the speed and the rotation of that because you're less likely to be recommended, cited, etc., which means all of those other things start to fall over and collapse. So, yeah, we need to be much more on top of the the culture and reputational backgrounds of our products and services because they're just as important as the tangible thing itself. Yeah, exactly. And and like you said, it's very competitive you know, every industry is very competitive. So there's always an alternative. So if you do look to change something like that, and maybe, you know, for the founders, it was the right thing to do. It's now what they believe in. And and that, you know, it, it reflects them and their changes as well. And that's fine. But it doesn't necessarily mean that now they're going to keep everybody just because their product's great. And I think yeah. that's the bit that they missed. Because Basecamp is, you know, is very well known and has has had customer base for a very long time. A lot of loyal customers, but also a lot of loyal employees who started out from the very beginning, gone through that whole journey to then completely change your direction. It's a really, it's a very odd approach that they've taken there, I think. Yeah, it is. But both both the change itself and the way it was not communicated. And yeah, absolutely. Every time I look into Basecamp and I see the logo, I'm going to sub- subconsciously think, am I now being complicit to racism, d- disclusion, whatever else? And that's going to nag at me. And I'm going to think maybe I should be using Trello or Asana instead. I mean, body amp could work. But yeah, it's, exactly. it's really hard to separate the experience of the product from the experience of the brand. So from all of that experience that you've gained, you know, it's a vast amount, especially when you've gone from agency to client to now technology provider. What advice would you give your younger self if you were to start out in marketing again today? It's challenging, isn't it? I'm so, I, I love my job and my role so much. I love everything I've done and everything I do. So I guess do do what I do, but, but push harder. I guess the big thing that I started doing without realizing that it was a virtue um, initially was give yourself permission to challenge the brief uh, always because um, the brief is almost always wrong. Whatever the brief is, wherever it's from, or it has room for improvement, or it's limited in scope arbitrarily, or it's based on an individual's interpretation of what they think they need to do to execute rather than what they need to do to achieve their goals. So ask difficult questions. And yes, sometimes you need to earn some social currency to do that, but do buy people beers and then next week ask them awkward questions and challenge the brief find out what success looks like challenge the brief maybe occasionally even challenge the stated goals and again you need to build up the the social currency to do that but it's always always important to challenge the constraints and the scope of responsibilities especially in a space like seo where for example uh, we, we put ourselves in little boxes based on a combination of our skills and what we're good at and what's expected of us. So many, many SEO people will tweak page titles and go and try and find ways to build links. They will very, very rarely say, hey, senior management, have we considered our pricing strategy? And there's no reason why you can't ask that question. You, It might be, might be difficult to do so. You might get ignored. You might get fired. Potentially, it's all a bit risky. But that's how you win, and it's how you grow, and it's how you elevate, and it's how you unlock access to the grown-up table, the better conversations, and how you win in markets and do better marketing. You can't succeed by just doing the thing. You, you have to try and push those boundaries and to challenge things. And, um, yeah, I, I, I would suggest to younger me that I do much more of that. Yeah, I think that's brilliant advice. I always remember when you're working in a, a company, I'll say now I work for my own company, but when I was working for a technology provider and there'll always be the core people that would challenge anything. Mm-hmm. So it would be like, oh, is that person going to attend the meeting? Yeah, they're coming. Oh, this would be interesting because now they're going to challenge. And it's like, but actually everybody should be like that. They should be challenging or questioning and coming in from a different perspective because that's how how you develop and grow and change your perspectives and develop yeah, as a marketeer. It, yeah, it's how I became fascinated about process development. Because yeah, don't don't be the person who who just asks annoying questions or awkward or difficult. Yeah, questions I'm not saying be that. Again, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but trying if you a lot of the answers to those questions will often be I don't know. There is no reason. Let's work out a process. You can preempt that, and you can actually come with okay. It looks like. The brief is flawed in this way because we didn't have these questions in place. Here's what I think the process to define those questions and those answers might look like. Oh, look, 
I've just matured the business. And uh, again, you have permission to do that. Nobody, it's going to be very, it's about to say nobody, be very rare to get shot down for saying, here is a process that will improve the way that we work. Like Everyone is always open to that. And so many of those types of processes and questions fall between people's jobs and responsibilities. Very few businesses have somebody whose job it is to make your department communicate better with their department. But you can do that. But you can carve out the space to do it. So, yeah, make a mess. Yeah, I totally agree. I think if you come with the question, the challenge, and then you have, actually, this might be a better solution, and you've got some ideas to that, brilliant. I think that's that's definitely, I think you then start, like you say, can start to get more involved in those conversations, because it's not so much of a, okay, well, now you're challenging things. And I don't know if we've got time to be talking about that right now. We're just going to do this way, because it's easier. And it stops that. So yeah, I think yeah. that's that's brilliant advice. Um, as always, a pleasure to talk to you, Jono. 100 miles an hour, like your presentation. <laughs> <Likewise. laughs> Thank you. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just brilliant to speak to you. And I hope everything continues to go really well at Yoast. So thank you so much for your time and contributing to the book as well. No, thank you. Good luck with the book. I'm looking forward to it.